we were just talking about the ports a little bit. Um, so I thought this might be a little bit of an interesting view, particularly for two of our products that we um, that are that are very important businesses for us: container board and fluff pulp. Um, you get a little bit of an idea. We we actually export almost a quarter of everything that we make in the U.S. A little less than that. Twenty-two percent was the last number I saw. Um, in fact, Gary forwarded me something uh, an article a week or two ago, maybe it was a month or two ago, IP was um, recognized of shipping containers, so of volume of, of shipping containers. We're the third largest in the U.S. now. A lot of that, by the way, goes out of the, um, out of the port here in Georgia. And speaking of Georgia, I think you all know this, but I, would, I, I put this chart up here really to say thanks. Georgia has been an incredibly good place for us to, um, to live and work and grow in. Uh, most recently through the acquisition of Warehouser's fluff pulp business, we've, we've added a few more facilities. But you can kind of get a look for just how significant Georgia is for us. And again, I, I want to say thanks to, uh, to the state because it is a good place to, to, to operate. Huge economic impact, huge investment, and we continue to, uh, to find ways to uh, improve our businesses while we're here, hopefully, and to grow them. So. You saw the vision probably in the, um, in the video that was, that was shown. But what I want to talk about just for a minute, so this, is, this was pulled from a, a, from a deck that we share with um, a lot of our investors, and particularly folks on Wall Street, to kind of describe, okay, what is our, what is our overall strategy? Our, our current CEO, Mark Sutton, who sort of grew up in the business, he put some few words around the strategy that I think makes a lot of sense, and that's uh, we're going to be in the fiber-based world. So that's one first thing that we that we say we're we're not moving away from that. But we're looking for advantaged positions in advantaged markets. What's that really mean? We're looking for markets that we think have good growth potential, and then we want to be able to operate. We want to be located in the right places so that we can operate at a at the uh, lower end, if you will. Of the of the cost curve, so we can continue to um, to win and profit and grow. Hopefully, I like to mention that, particularly when I'm in front of a group like this. The cool thing about a forestry association, it represents all segments of the supply chain, from landowners to service providers, to loggers, to sawmills, to exporters. And the I think one of the things that keeps this industry um, I, as positive and as fun, frankly, and as successful, is we depend on each other to the highest degree. Doesn't really matter how big or how small our individual businesses might be, we can't do it on our own. There aren't really integrated companies from the standpoint that are doing everything that it takes to run their business on their own now. They're, we are dependent on one another. And I like that dependence. I think it kind of keeps us uh, honest, if you will, from how do we, and, and sort of provides the umbrella for how do we work together, how do we have conversations, how do we collaborate to figure out a, in a changing world what it's going to take to succeed. You know, one of the things that um, a colleague of mine had said a couple of years ago even, they said, you know, part of the problem that we've got in, in the industry, not just international paper, is that, um, is that we take high emotion inputs, high emotion raw materials, wood, water, and make low emotion products, boxes, paper. Um, I've begun to think about that differently. In fact, another colleague recently, uh, that, that statement was made, and this was at a, at, in a meeting that we were having around sustainability. Uh, we brought in all of our businesses and we're talking about that. But um, somebody had made that comment and uh, our new, someone who's part of our fluff pulp business, he said, now wait a minute, I want to I challenge that a little bit. I think, in fact, we do make um, high emotion products. And as I thought about that, he's exactly right. And I think we should maybe acknowledge that more than we do and sort of be very outward facing in the uh, communities in the world that we live and work in with that. And if you think about it, and so yeah, we make boxes. In fact, international paper, and I'll talk about this in a few minutes a little bit more, but we make about one out of every three boxes that's floating around the US. 
if we could stop the production immediately and everything just stopped where it was, pulp machine shut down, the truck stopped, the box plant stopped, if we could stop that within 48 hours, we'd have food rotten in the fields, um, whether it be fruit and vegetables. You know, that begins to get pretty emotional to somebody pretty quick, right? So that's one example of it. It's, it if you think even about pulp, and this was, uh, this was the example that was used, he said, I beg to differ. He said, tell me a mom who's putting a baby diaper <laughs> on a six-month-old child that, that's, not, um, that's not thinking about emotion. And not only that, and, and again, you'll see a little bit about how we, um, how we see fluff pulp business growing across the world, but just as it relates to diapers in emerging economies around the world that folks that have now um, seen their economies grow to the point that they have money to be able to buy diapers rather than use cloth, that has increased the um, the survival rate of infants uh, dramatically across the world. So it's, a, um, it's, a, it's pretty heavy stuff when you're making a product that is improving the uh, survival of, of life around the world. The next one, I guess, um, on paper, and that one's, I think, pretty straightforward. How many in here learned to read because they saw they had printed words on a piece of paper? I'm betting almost everybody in here did. We take a lot of that for granted but I don't think we should. And um, this is, uh, I'll use this one as an example too. This one's real easy. Um, if I don't have one of these, and a lot of you don't have one of these early in the morning, and maybe especially if your wives don't have one of these early in the morning, things get real emotional real quick. <laughs> so um, I've come to look at some of this a little bit differently. And I think, and I think we should. <coughs> Keep track of my time here a little bit. Um, so how is this playing out for us? Most of you know within the pulp and paper industry, we had had a long, long period of time where we couldn't even earn cost of capital. So if we can't at least earn the returns that what we can borrow money for effectively, what we have invested in there, then you ultimately can't survive. Um, this industry had, had, and international paper in particular, had had long runs where we were not earning the cost of capital, but um, I think as we've sort of uh, taken this strategy, and I think John was right when he said, let's focus on a few things that we can be really good at, and starting around 2010, we got above the cost of capital line, and you can see we've stayed above there for a few years. That's actually, believe it or not, that's the longest run in modern history that we've had of being above cost of capital returns. Um, and we generate a lot of cash. We've got, uh, we've got a pretty high fixed cost. What that's allowed us to do is reinvest in the business. That's the kind of thing that allowed us to buy the fluff pulp business. Um, and, you know, and that's one of those things that I believe, there's probably folks from warehouser in here, but I think that's another one of those cases where a warehouser says, what are the things that we want to be the few good things that we're really good at? Um, for example, when we sold our Timberland, when we sold our sawmills, the companies that are running the former sawmills, I'm convinced they're doing a better job of it than we were because we were spread too thin. And I think at our DNA in, in international paper, we're a paper company. It pains me to say that a little bit because I want to say we were a Timberland's company because I'm a forester. <laughs> but, um, but I'm still happy to be part of a company that is allowing, you know, we used, I think Gary said, 60 million tons of wood that we consume here in the U.S. It's actually about 65 when you consider the fiber fuel. Um, by the time you, so you can do the math on this a different way, but um, you can pretty easily come up with, we're helping to provide the economic drivers for somewhere between 40 and 50 million acres of timberland. So very quickly, I wanted to walk through sort of our core businesses these days. We've got the industrial packaging business. Uh, that is sort of the big cash generator for us today. I think that's going to look uh, different five years from now. Um, consumer packaging, that's, uh, that's an important business for us. Uh, maybe the most exciting part about that has been paper cups. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, global cellulose fibers, though, that's the latest strategic development that we've jumped in. We were already pretty big in, in fluff pulp and, and market pulp, uh, but we doubled in size when we bought Weyerhaeuser's business. And I will further say we not only doubled in size, but we far more than, I guess, the assets that we picked up, and I think the people that came along with that business, 
Uh, this this offends some people in IP when I say this, but I think they were better than we, we are in that business. And I don't apologize for that, for, for the main reason of we sort of backed into the fluff pulp business more recently. In other words, as we've repurposed some mills that used to make newsprint or used to make white paper, um, we've, we've repurposed them for fluff pulp. And it's very hard in the first few years to do that and have a first or second quartile for mill. So it's taken us a little longer time. This has been a strategic, had been a strategic business of Weyerhaeuser for a longer period of time, and particularly around innovation and some of the uh, uh, some of the technology, the ways that they're thinking about and have been thinking about fluff pulp and how to make it better. So while that's a small number today, I think we're going to see that number as a percent of our total sales really increase over the next five years. And then, and then papers, and papers is, uh, is a, I think we probably all know, while the demand in this country has been going down, um, it's not going down at the same rate, and we think it'll probably asymptote out at some level. Um, it will continue to be a good business for a, number of, for a number of companies in this country for a long time to come. But quickly, I mentioned we're about 30 percent of the market. A little bit of an interesting view as to how that's changed over the, uh, over the last um, really 10 year, 20 years, I guess that is. And I've just, um, the blue bars there, or the blue part of the circle is international paper, so we went from 7% back in 1995 to 30% of the market today. Top two producers, 50% of the market today versus <coughs> far less, um, far more fragmented back in 95 where that was only 20%. So that is one of those areas that we really staked the claim and said we think we, think we want to be in the box business for a long time. Um, Box business is a good business. We talked about the Amazon effect. Um, that is, um, that's an interesting one. It's maybe not as you might first think that's hugely positive for international paper. Just any of you that buy from Amazon yourself and you see sometimes the boxes that are now coming to our homes, um, boxes in boxes a lot of time. Not all of that is new boxes. Some of that is a change of channel from, from bigger warehouses to a more direct shipping. But the net net of it still is positive. It's also changed things like recycle the, I would say the, not really the structure of recycling, but temporarily I think it's going to result in a little less recovery. We recover almost 80% of the cardboard that's used in this country, incredibly high number. It's the most recyclable paper that's out there. But as we've got smaller boxes that are beginning to show up in, in smaller homes, if you will, sometimes in places where you don't have the same recycling um, systems in place, I think for a short period of time, we're going to see that go backwards. I don't mean go backwards by 5%. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's a percent or so over the next couple of years. Technology will, will solve that. First of all, we'll be able to pull some of those smaller boxes out of the waste streams and recycling plants that are out there. And I believe we'll find other channels of how to pick that up. Who, who knows? Uh, probably, very likely, I would say, we'll have return folks that are delivering boxes and returning kind of at the same time. That already exists in some places. But um, so it's a good business for us. It gives you a little bit about what's going on there. In general, this is a business that's growing at about two and a half percent globally, a little less than that in this country. But remember, we export an awful lot of boxes around other parts of the, other parts of the world. I mentioned our export. By the way, we import less than one percent. I, I love that stat because it shows the U.S. and the Southeast U.S. is incredibly competitive still in the world that, that, that we're in. So it's a good place to work. We're competitive with our labor, we're competitive with our raw materials, we're competitive with our manufacturing. And I think we're winning back some of that that we have maybe lost as a country and even as an industry over the last 20 years. It's fun to be part of that. So we put together some pretty decent returns on the, on the, um, on the box or the container board and box business. That'll continue to be a, a big part of who international paper is over the next, uh, over the next decades to come. Consumer packaging, you can get a little bit of an idea of some of the things that we um, are in there. That's an incredibly interesting um, world. It's a wide array of products that you see we're involved with. I talked a little bit about cups. You can kind of get an idea. So of all of that Broadway, we're about 20% of that, uh, of that industry. But you look at the bars there, and you'll notice that in the two areas, we're actually uh, folding, uh, folding boxes. That might be used for cosmetics. That might be used for a, for a number of things, but especially cup stock. Um, what's been happening with cups over the last couple of years? You know, as as 
a lot of, um, first of all, there's a lot more places to buy coffee today than there was 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. Um, and we pay a heck of a lot more for a cup of coffee today than most of us would have, or at least most of us do, I would say. Which, and a lot of the folks that are willing to pay $3 for a cup of coffee have a real environmental bent. And so the idea of foam versus paper, uh, we're, winning that, we're winning that war and folks that I think have understood that yes, this is a far more sustainable product than, uh, than most of the foam alternatives that are out there. So that's where a lot of the growth has been coming from. Um, there's still a lot of foam that's out there, still a lot of opportunity and for that reason, we expect that this will continue to grow for, for a while. Um, there's, I talked already a little bit about, um, about cellulose fibers, but um, it's really three big areas that, um, that I guess we would point to. What I've got broken out on this slide is where do, where's the demand in the world and then where's the demand by, by product. There's really three big products that are, that are out there. Baby diapers, right? Um, <laughs> also at the other end of that spectrum, adult continent incontinence and then feminine care. The, um, those are the big areas. You'll even notice the air laid portion that's on there which gets into a lot of really interesting and cool products. But that's, um, every one of those are growing and growing pretty well. Um, I suspect most of you know this. Today, the very best thing to make fluff pulp out of is a loblolly pine tree. And especially a loblolly pine tree growing within 100 miles of the coast. So that today, we, have an, we collectively, the industry, have a huge advantage over the rest of the world. We've tried to make it out of eucalyptus. You can do it, but it's, it doesn't today have nearly the properties. You can try to make it out of radiata pine. You can make it out of softwood in Russia. None of those places meet the absorbency. And think about this, not just absorbency, but absorbency per um, thickness. That helps with things like shipping and storage and all of that, but back to the emotion side, back to the side of the adult incontinence, wouldn't you, really, if, wouldn't you really want something that's thinner rather than thicker if you're sort of in that situation? I, I, I think so, and so I, I don't know. I suspect there's people around the world that are working on trying to make fluff pulp out of something different, uh, but this is a strategic advantage for the industry and this state and this country. Um, particularly the southeast U.S. today, and I think it will be for a while. A number of things on papers, and I'll kind of quickly hit on that. I think we know this has been a bit of a shrinking industry, and as a result, there's been consolidation in this business as well. Um, our percent of the market is up a little bit over that time period that you see. Uh, the top two is dramatically different, as it will. That's um, that's part of the reason I think as folks have understood how do we really operate in a world where demand has been dropping by three, four, five percent a year, frankly, over about the last 10 years. And, um, and, and what that, so the downside of it is as demand has been shrinking there, the positive side is it's allowed us as an industry to find what are the very best places, what are our best mills to make this, what are the best basins to operate in to make this. Um, the good news is even as demand continues to shrink on this sum, and it will, and I think what we'll face is we'll see uh, more white mill conversions over the coming years uh, by anybody that's sort of playing in there. Um, but as demand is increasing on container board, as demand is increasing on fluff pulp, as demand is increasing even on cup stock in a number of places, I think we'll see the opportunity to take advantage of the, the basins that we're, that we're in. So I thought I'd begin to Sort of close out, one of the things, uh, I don't know if Frank is still in here, but I enjoyed watching his presentation earlier. And it always, um, when I get to see somebody that has developed some of the same, same data, whoops, um, not, just, not just this chart, but a number of places, largely it sounds like the assumptions that, um, that he has made and the way that he's sort of reading the, the data that's available to us largely aligns with the way that, that we see things. I, apparently, that must be a hint for me to finish really quickly. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> um, but this is a little different chart than you'll see most anywhere else, and we sort of developed that. We um, pull in a bunch of different data from a lot of different areas. But we were trying to look at sort of almost 
think of it almost as first point of purchase and really a focus in on more the pulpwood segment of fiber. Uh, I've included pellets in here because you know that that almost exclusively comes out of either either the um, boy I don't know what I'm doing there um, either out of the pulpwood size material or other residuals that can be used either for fiber fuel or for uh, or for paper making but you kind of get the idea there that from a uh, softwood standpoint is um, how much volume is moving kind of around the world and where it's headed to and I think there's a gremlin in this rascal. Either that or he's having fun with me over there. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be that I'm just not capable of running this, which is the most likely. Um, I want to draw attention, though, to the very bottom um, part of the slide down there, which shows global pine pulpwood demand. And um, I've apparently set this on a automatic drive here. Um, but that is increasing, we see that increasing. That is increasing in the U.S., particularly in the southeast as well. On hardwood, you'll notice that was also increasing. I don't know how to stop that. Um, but I would say that's a little bit different playing out. Most of the hardwood that you see moving around, you see the U.S. is pretty much blank. Uh, most of the hardwood that is moving, I won't say there's zero tons moving out from a, from a pulpwood or um, chip um, basis, but there's very little. Eucalyptus um, competes more strongly on a world market for shipping, around, for shipping around the world. In the U.S., the demand for hardwood has been going down a little bit over the last, uh, over the last few years. I think that's likely to continue for paper making I'm talking about because as I've talked about, white paper demand, which is around a 50-50 mix of pine and hardwood, depending on how, what your recipe is, um, that's been going down. And with that, that's been taking some of the hardwood consumption down with it. So the, um, so I think in the U.S. at least, and even in the Southeast, we'll see a little bit less hardwood usage, um, a little more pine usage as, as uh, time moves on. Get it? I'm not sure what I did, but I'm glad you were able to fix it. <laughs> And um, so I guess just to, just to wrap up and uh, sort of open things up for questions, I think the pulp and paper industry is a good place to continue to, uh, to operate. I think it's going to be an important part of the forest products industry in this country and certainly in Georgia for not just years to come but for decades to come. I think a lot of the same players that are here today will be here and there will be some new players that none of us probably could, could even predict now. Uh, but I've got a view as long as we're as long as we have a resource that's sustainable and sustainably managed and cost competitive the world is going to find out how to use that and we'll be able to kind of build that into our various business plans so I know I've already said this but I guess just sort of the last comment before I open things up uh, to uh, to questions is that we really recognize that, that without a lot of the folks that are kind of in this room and certainly a lot of folks that are in this industry, that we don't have a business plan. We can't, we can't, we can't make a ton of paper. And we certainly can't sell a ton of paper. And we wouldn't be around. So uh, the one point I guess I really want to emphasize is how much we want to kind of understand what folks are thinking about. We want to understand new ways to collaborate in order to build a more successful model for kind of everybody in here because again one of us can't win and the rest of us lose. Thanks. All right, we have uh, we have a few minutes for questions before we take a quick break. You talked about loblolly pine being the premier species for, for pulp. And, uh, you know, some of the other species aren't doing it, uh, like eucalyptus. But they, aren't they planting loblolly in other parts of the world, particularly Africa? And do you see that as a trend that continu will continue because of the loblolly here? Yeah, I, I, I do. We've, we've, um, we've got operations in Brazil as well. We don't grow much pine there. 
uh, but, we've, but we've studied the, the loblolly in that part of the world. Um, growth rates are a little different. Uh, the early wood component is a little different with regard to, um, with regard to fiber length, specific gravity. So there's some minor differences to that, but you can make good fluff pulp out of loblolly in South America. Um, there's some, and there's a growing base there. We've done a little bit of math that thinks today there's probably enough excess uh, loblolly that's, um, that's being used or that's not being utilized today to maybe make 100,000, 150,000 tons of, of pulp. But that's growing. Over the next 10 years, I think that maybe becomes closer to a million tons. And I suspect, uh, I suspect we'll see some, it's too good of a business and it's a worldwide business as I showed you. Folks will figure out how to do that to make a product and, and will compete with us. So I think that, I'm glad you asked the question. We can't really rest on our laurels here. We need to kind of continue to figure out how to make it better so that we maintain and sustain the competitive advantage we have today. Lee, a number of us were able to uh, uh, be with the bars at their farm and listen to EPA director and, and um, uh, the Secretary of Ag. Uh, and business climate seems to be changing a little bit. Is it too early to talk about greenfield paper mills in the U.S. again? Well, it's, it's too early for me to talk about that. Um, I think it's too early for international paper to talk about that. Obviously, it's being talked about a little bit. I think we all have seen the announcements of a greenfield mill potentially in Arkansas. Um, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a fair question. I think it's a big bet today because um, the, I saw a slide that I liked. It was actually put together by our, um, the head of our government affairs in D.C. And it was a picture of what looked like, you know, the great American screen machine on steroids. It was this magnificent roller coaster. And it was sort of up and down and in and around. And the headline said, um, Trump making roller coasters great again. <laughs> I, the, the point is, I think there's still a lot of questions that are out there. Um, is it a better business environment today? It sure seems to be. Uh, does it seem to be a little bit more rational in that regard? It seems to be. I suspect more folks will say, hey, maybe it makes sense to do something. A, a greenfield mill is incredibly complex and complicated, and even in a better business environment, it's my belief, they're harder than we realize. It's been a long time since we've done one in this, in this country. Um, the technology, you know, I didn't talk about water today, but I do believe that we'll be talking more and more and more and more about water. Um, if we snap 10 years forward and looked at an agenda for the GF, a annual meeting, I bet water is going to be somewhere on there. Um, and we consume, and the paper industry consumes a lot, we use a lot of water, I guess I would say. So I think the challenge for us is to figure out how to use less of it and how to, and how to um, put it back in even better shape than, than, than the industry is doing today. So a little bit of a long-winded answer, but um, I'd be a little surprised if we saw a proliferation of, of, uh, of greenfield announcements on the, on the paper side. You'll see some on the recovered side. Um, it's far more easier to make a container board mill that uses 100% recycle. I even think that'll slow down though because if any of you follow the OCC or old cord cardboard, the price of that is up now. We're collecting that closer to the practical maximum around the world, and as so, that's going to be a little more volatile, I think. And as a so, so for somebody that's looking to buy or to build a recovered, 100% uh, recovered fiber mill, I think the price to play went up a whole lot on what is far away their biggest input cost. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lee. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, and we, we certainly appreciate your thoughts and your perspectives on where we're heading. Thanks so much. Yeah, appreciate it. My pleasure. The, uh, and ne next year we'll have, uh, we're going to ask IP to, to sponsor our, our, co our coffee cups at the, uh, <laughs> we'll I think someone noticed that we had a lot of plastic cups out there, so <laughs> we can do better.